right. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University where the Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project is based. Today I want to welcome everyone to our 16th lecture. Our speaker tonight or this morning is Professor Brian Van Norden from Vassar College and we have a lineup of commentators to discuss his talk. We have Professor Linda Liu Qin from Wuhan Dao, uh, University, Professor Cai Tsinghua from Fudan University, and my colleague uh, from East China Normal University, Professor Liu Liangjian. Um, and our chair for this event is Professor Zhang Yunxi from Beijing University. The topic of Professor Van Norden's lecture is Confucius on the philosophy of language, how not to rectify names. The structure for the event is as follows. Zhang Yunxi will introduce Professor Van Norden and then Professor Van Norden will give his talk. Um, then the three commentators uh, will be introduced by the chair Zhang Yunxi and then they'll discuss in turn um, their comments with Professor Van Norden. Uh, once they're done with this, we'll open the floor to comments from the audience. We'll end the event probably at 10.30 a.m. Beijing time, which is about 90 minutes from now. So before getting started and handing things over to Zhang Yunxi, I want to first say a few things about the Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sihai Weishu Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Projects seeks, seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. So before introducing our chair, I want to thank Professor Van Norden again for taking the time to give us this talk uh, tonight for you and I, and this morning for many other people. Um, a few years ago, we began a graduate student conference series at East China Normal University, and the students uh, asked Professor Van Norden to serve as the inaugural keynote speaker. Legends of his karaoke skills are still whispering <laughs> in every event we've had since. But more seriously, Professor Van Norden, I really wanted to thank you for the time you took to engage with the students during that event. I think it was really admirable um, I know myself, I'm not always as generous with uh, <laughs> trying to provide encouragement and support as some other people. So um, I just want to sort of formally thank you again for being so encouraging to the young scholars during that event. Now I want to hand things over to our chair, Zhang Yunxi. Zhang Yunxi is a PhD candidate in philosophy at P uh, Peking University. She specializes in neo-Taoism with a focus on Guoxiang, and she also works on neo-Confucian philosophy, particularly on Chengyi and Zhu Xi, um, as well as comparative philosophy. So thank you, Zhang Yunxi, for chairing this event, and I'll hand things over to you. Thank you, Professor Ambrosio. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. I feel very honored to be the moderator today. And first, please allow me to introduce Professor Brian Van Norden. He is James Monroe Tyler Chair in Philosophy at Vassar College USA, and also Chair Professor in the School of Philosophy at Wuhan University. He received his PhD degree from Stanford University in 1991. He has published 10 books on Chinese and comparative philosophy, including Take 
Taking Back Philosophy, a Multicultural Manifesto, Virtue Ethics and Consequentialism in Early Chinese Philosophy, The Ways of Confucianism, Investigations in Chinese Philosophy, which all have been translated into Chinese, and uh, most recently, the third edition of Readings in Classical Chinese Philosophy. Professor Van Norden is also an influential public intellectual, a two-time winner of the American Philosophical Association Public Philosophy Prize. His most influential essays for the general public includes Confucius on Gay Marriage, If Philosophy Won't Diversify, Let's Call It What It Really Is, The Ignorant, Do Not Have a Right to an Audience, and Was This Asian Taoist the First Philosopher of Disability? Um, please, now let's welcome Professor Brian Van Norden's lecture with our applause. Thank you so much for the extremely generous uh, introduction and uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I've, I'm very honored and I hope you, I will uh, make good use of your time with what I have to say. So without further ado, the, the structure of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about first uh, contemporary interpretations of a passage, Analects 13.3, dealing with Zhengming. I'm gonna then talk about the dramatic context of the passage, and then next, the date of composition of it. And those are, of course, different things. For example, Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, the dramatic context is the time of the ancient Roman Empire, but Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, was, of course, not composed during that period. And so likewise, we can ask of this passage in the Analects, when is it supposed to be set dramatically? And then when was it actually composed? And then I think it's going to be helpful to look at the history of interpretations of Analects 13.3. In other words, how did current interpretations of the passage historically develop and how were they influenced by trends in philosophy at the time they were developed? And finally, what are some general lessons we could learn from this examination of Analects 13.3? So Analects 13.3 uh, deals with Zhengming, and uh, I'm going to use an English translation here. Uh, the passage opens with Zulu asking, if the Duke of Wei were to employ you to serve in the government of his state, what would be your first priority? Confucius replies, it would, of course, be the rectification of names, Zhengming. Zulu said, could you, master, really be so far off the mark? Why worry about rectifying names? The master replied, how boorish you are, Zulu. When it comes to matters that he does not understand, the gentleman should remain silent. If names are not rectified, speech will not be appropriate. When speech is not appropriate, things will not be successfully accomplished. When things are not successfully accomplished, ritual and music will fail to flourish. When ritual and music fail to flourish, punishments and penalties will miss the mark. And when punishments and penalties miss the mark, the common people will be at a loss as to what to do with themselves. This is why the gentleman only applies names that can be properly spoken and assures that what he says can be properly put into action. The gentleman simply guards against arbitrariness in his speech. This is all there is to it. Well, that's a, a fascinating exchange, but what does it really mean? Um, generally, uh, I think the most common view is that rectifying names, Zhengming, is about making names and the things those names ap apply to appropriate to one another. And this can work in one of two directions. So you can reform your naming practices to be appropriate for the objects named, or you can reform the objects so that they are appropriate for the names that are used of them. That's a little abstract, so let's look at some concrete examples. One passage that is sometimes thought to illustrate reforming names to suit the object would be Mengzi 1b8. Uh, in this passage, King Xuan of Qi asked, is it the case that uh, Tong banished tyrant Jie and that Wu struck down tyrant Zhou? Mengzi responded, there are such accounts in the historical records. The king said, 
Is it acceptable for subjects to kill their rulers? Mengzi said, one who violates benevolence should be called a thief. One who violates righteousness is called a mutilator. A mutilator and a thief is called a mere fellow. I have heard of the execution of a mere fellow, Joe, but I have not heard of the killing of one's ruler. So in other words, uh, the king is asking, well, is it okay for subjects to kill their own rulers? And Mengzi says, well, in the case of Jia and Zhou, they might have begun as kings or rulers, but because they were so vicious, they no longer merit the title of ruler or king. And so in killing them, Tang and Wu, respectively, were punishing a criminal with capital punishment, not executing a legitimate ruler. So they don't deserve the title of ruler or king anymore because they're not acting in an appropriate way. So we should stop calling them ruler or king. Another passage that's thought to perhaps illustrate rectifying names is this one, um, that it, we sometimes translate in English as a goo that is not a goo. What a goo. What a goo. <laughs> uh, now, there's been a lot of discussion in the commentaries about what is wrong with the goo that Confucius Kongze is talking about here. And as we know, a goo is a kind of ritual vessel used for drinking wine. Uh, it can come in, you know, these are two examples of vessels that are traditionally classified as a gu. Uh, my favorite theory, uh, I don't think we know for sure, but my favorite theory is that originally a gu was small and it was for sipping wine decorously at a ceremony. And people had begun to use larger examples of goo because they wanted to have enough wine to chug and get really drunk. And so Confucius is objecting that what gets called a goo now is not really a goo, perhaps because it's supposed to be like a little sipping, as we, we sometimes say in English slang, a sippy cup, you know, a little cup for just sipping a little bit of wine, just tasting it, and it's become a chugging cup for getting drunk. So you shouldn't call these things goo. People do, but that's not really what a goo is because a goo is for having like a little sip of wine, not for chugging it. Don't use the term goo to describe this thing. In the other direction, reforming objects to suit their names, some people think a passage from book 12 in the Analects illustrates this aspect of rectifying names. So Duke Jing of Qi asked Kungza about governing and Kongza replied, let the rulers be rulers, let the ministers be ministers, let the fathers be fathers, let the sons be sons. The duke replied, excellent. If the rulers are not rulers, the ministers not ministers, the fathers not fathers, and the sons not sons, even if there is grain, will I get to eat it? So the idea here is that there are people who are called ruler, jun, but they don't act like rulers. There are people who are called ministers, chun, but they don't act like ministers. People who are fathers and are called fathers don't act like fathers. Sons don't act like sons. The implication is that in a well-run society, people will live up to the obligations that are inherent in the titles that belong to them. So I'm a teacher. That's the title that belongs to me. So I ought to teach. I ought to put effort into communicating my ideas to my students and grading them fairly. Uh, my students are students. That's the title that applies to them. They should do their homework. They should complete the readings. Um, and if people live up to the roles that go with the titles that belong to them, if they reform the object to meet the name, and the duties implied by the name will have a well-functioning society, but we won't have a well-functioning society if we don't do that. Now, how might these things apply to our own society? Well, uh, let's talk about reforming our naming practices to be appropriate to the objects named. One title we have in English uh, is philosopher and corresponding to zhe shui jia in uh, Chinese, 
And oftentimes, uh, I don't know if this example uh, works as well for the our current audience, but in the United States, there are many people whose favorite philosopher uh, is Ayn Rand. Um, and uh, I personally think Ayn Rand is uh, really bad at philosophy. And so if we're going to follow the Confucian rectification of names, we should stop calling people like Ayn Rand philosophers and instead reserve the term philosopher for people who are actually very good at philosophy, like Martha Nussbaum at the University of Chicago. And instead, we should use terms like sophist to describe people like Ayn Rand, who uh, think they're doing philosophy, but really aren't very good at it. That's a, a minor application of rectification of names, but that's one example. Um, Remember, the other aspect of the rectification of names is reforming the objects to be appropriate for the names that are used of them. And one very important term is family. Now, this is a pop culture example from a few years ago, and it's kind of out of date even when I give this talk in the United States. But anyway, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, the gentleman on the left in this photograph, uh, was a heavy metal musician who was famous for his uh, heavy metal music, his heavy metal rock music, and also having a very crazy lifestyle. And uh, his uh, daughter and his wife and his son, respectively, from left to right there, and he were on a reality show where cameras would follow them around and watch what they did day to day. And on the show they actually had a very combative relationship, right? So they're a family, the name family applies to them, but they weren't acting like a family. The children didn't respect their parents. The parents were not being good role models for the children. They weren't providing guidance or discipline. Fortunately, a few years after the show was broadcast, uh, they came back on television and they said, you know, things have changed a lot. We're actually doing very well now. And you can see they're getting along. They all look very nice now. And so one way of applying the rectification of names in a contemporary context would be saying, well, if you're part of a family, act like a healthy family. Or if you're a father or a mother, act like a father, act like a mother, act like a, mm -hmm. a daughter, act like a son. Now, why is it so important that we achieve the rectification of names? The passage seems to suggest 13.3, and the Analects suggests, oh, this is central to everything. Shunza, of course, has an essay, Rectifying Names, and he gives an explanation for why it's so important that we rectify names. He says, so when the kings, meaning the sage kings, established names, the names were fixed, and the corresponding objects were thus distinguished. This way was followed, and the king's intentions were thus understood. They then carefully led the people to adhere to these things single-mindedly. Thus, they called it great vileness to mince words and recklessly create names, so as to disorder the rectified names, and thereby confuse the people and cause them to engage in much disputation and litigation. This wrongdoing was considered to be just like the crime of forging tallies and measures. So just like you need tallies and measures to effectively engage in commerce, so you need terms that whose meaning is understood that are applied to appropriate objects so that we know what objects and individuals, what standards they should live up to, so the intentions of the kings are well understood, and the people will know what norms they should follow. Shunzi continues, because none of the people dared rely on making up strange names so as to disorder the rectified names, they were unified in following the proper model of the way and were conscientious in following commands. Nowadays, the sage kings have passed away, and the preservation of these names has become lax. Strange words have arisen. The names and their corresponding objects are disordered, and the forms of right and wrong are unclear. So people don't know what the standards of right and wrong are, 
because people either don't know how to use the terms correctly or they use the terms of the right thing, but then people don't know what evaluative standards are built into those terms, and so they don't know what standards they're supposed to be living up to. What would that, what difference would that make in contemporary society? Well, again, here, I apologize for using another pop culture example that's a little old fashioned, even in the United States now, but there was a whole genre of television shows in the United States, uh, the afternoon talk show. And afternoon talk shows were famous for bringing people onto the show who had done terrible things to their friends and family members. And then the people would usually get into a fight, either a screaming match, or as you can see in this shot, sometimes a physical fight. And the shows literally had bouncers. I mean, that's somebody who has to break up a fight, usually in a bar. Uh, but the shows had bouncers that were these big, strong guys who would get in and pull people apart when they started to fight. Um, and just to give you an illustration, I was I saw one of these shows once where there was uh, a a husband who had cheated on his wife with his wife's mother. And after they revealed that on the show, they brought the grandmother out and it turned out the husband had also cheated on his wife with his wife's grandmother. Now, obviously, in this situation, the husband is not acting like a husband, the mother is not acting like a mother, and the grandmother is not acting like a grandmother either. Um, so Shunza and Kungza are suggesting that the failure of rectifying names ultimately is social chaos because people are not living up to the roles that are built into their the titles for the roles they occupy. Now, I think there's a consensus that those two aspects, using words appropriately, not attributing a title to something that it doesn't deserve, and when something occupies a role specified by a title, living up to the values and norms built into that title, I think there's a consensus that's part of rectified names. But many scholars have thought there was a third aspect of rectifying names. And they describe this third aspect in varying levels of strength. And by strength here, I mean ex how extreme the claim is. So not necessarily strong here doesn't necessarily mean better. I mean strong in the sense of a more extreme claim. So for example, John Makeup, a, a terrific scholar who's written about Zheng Ming and what it meant in the Han Dynasty in China, uh, said in passing, there are many passages in the Analects, the Lun Yu, that deal with the correction of names, even though they do not employ the specific term Zheng Ming. A bit more extreme, F.W. Moat, who wrote a very influential uh, history of Chinese political thought, said the correcting names is, quote, a functional concept throughout the Analects. Even more extreme, A.C. Graham said that the successful functioning of Confucian society depends on each person doing what rightly used names instruct him to do. So it's not just some passages in the Analects. It's not just all passages in the Analects. It's Confucian society in general depends on each person doing what rightly used names instruct them to do. And then finally, Benjamin Swartz, professor at Harvard, who wrote a great history of Chi ancient Chinese thought said correcting names was a preoccupation that marked the entire subsequent development of pre-Qin dynasty Chinese thought. And I remember when I was first studying Chinese philosophy, Swartz's view was common. There were many people who said, if you want to understand early Chinese philosophy, Shen Shen, Zhong Guo Jiaxue, you need to understand Zheng Ming because Zheng Ming is central to all of early Chinese thought. So what is rectifying names? It's reforming naming practices to be appropriate for the objects named. It's reforming the objects so that they live up to or are appropriate for the names used of them. And many scholars have said it's a central concept in the Analects 
and perhaps a central concept throughout all of pre-Qin dynasty Chinese philosophy. I want to deny that last claim. And that's part of what I'm going to be arguing for in the remainder of my talk. So why do I want to reject this last claim? Well, a bunch of reasons. First, to understand the passage better, let's look at its dramatic context. In other words, when is this exchange between Zulu and Kongza supposed to have occurred? Well, this timeline seems probably accurate. In 496 BCE, Duke Ling is the ruler of Wei, and Nanza is his wife. The Duke's son, Kwai Kwai, tries to murder Nanza. He fails and flees the state. Now, Nanza, as we know, had a reputation for being licentious or adulterous. Um, I, I wonder whether she really was. I think that in traditional societies, when a woman gets into any position of authority, there's a tendency to just try to find something to blame her for. And accusing her of being promiscuous is a convenient and difficult to disprove uh, you know, claim to make for a woman who's involved in politics because she'll be having opportunities to see people. Um, but anyway, uh, the claim is that Nanza was adulterous and this was the motive for the Duke's son, Kwai Kwai, trying to murder him or murder her. And he failed and fled the state. Then in 493 BCE, Duke Ling dies and is succeeded by his grandson, Je, who is Kwai Kwai's son. And Je now becomes the new Duke of Duke Chu. At this point, Kwai Kwai attempts to return to assume the dukeship, but his son Je dispatches troops to prevent his return. Then around 489 BCE, while Zulu is an official in the state of Wei, Kungza makes a visit. And that would be the context in which Kungza is commenting on the rectification of names. Now, one of the things I think is really important for understanding the Analects is context sensitivity. The things that Confucius says, sometimes he'll make sort of general comments, but very often, when he makes a comment, it's tuned to the needs of his particular interlocutor, the particular person he's talking to. That's why the same disciple can ask the same question like, or ask about the same thing. Like you could, okay, one run, you can ask about humaneness or benevolence and get very different answers because Kungze is going to give different answers to different disciples depending on what they need to hear. And one of my favorite passages in the Analects is one near the end of Book 11, where two disciples come to Kongza, and they ask him the same question in the same words, and Kongza gives them opposite answers. And a third disciple, having seen Confucius give opposite answers to two disciples who ask the same question in the same words, asks, I think, the same question we would ask in this situation. Zihua inquired, when Zulu asked you whether or not one should immediately take care of something upon learning of it, you told him one should not, as long as one's father and elder brothers were still alive. When Ran Cho asked the same question, however, you told him that one should immediately take care of it. I am confused and humbly asked to have this explained to me. The master said, Ron Cho was overly cautious, and so I wished to urge him on. Zulu, on the other hand, is too impetuous, and so I sought to hold him back. Now, to me, that's one of the most fascinating aspects of the Confucian tradition, and you see this view that what you say is very context-sensitive and depends on the needs of the particular person you're talking to. You see this later in the Confucian tradition as well. Wang Yangming, for example, is a master of it, but Confucians in general are aware of it. I think we have to keep this in mind when we're reading 13.3 and Kungsa's comments on Zheng Ming. Because in Zheng Ming, you have Duke Ling, who is husband to Nanza and father of Kwai Kwai. And you've got Nanza, who's the wife of Duke Ling and the stepmother of Kwai Kwai. 
And you've got Kwai Kwai, who is the father of Ja, his son. And Ja is the son, of course, of Kwai Kwai. Allegedly, again, I don't want to badmouth Nanza when she's not here to defend, her, defend herself. But allegedly, Nanza was cheating on Duke Ling. And so she was not acting like a wife should. But Kwai Kwai, as a stepson, tried to murder his stepmother. And that's not acting like a stepson ought to behave. Now, when Kwai Kwai fled and then his son Ja succeeded to the dukedom, Kwai Kwai was not acting like a good father when he tried to return and usurp the rulership of his own son. But then Ja wasn't acting like a good son either because instead of relinquishing the throne to his father, he sent an army to keep his father expelled from the state and maintain his own power on the throne. So nobody in this state is really acting uh, like they ought to be given the role and the name, whether it's wife or stepmother or stepson or father or son. No one's living up to their title. And so it's very easy to see why in this situation, Kungza would talk about rectifying names. So my first claim is that Antlex 13.3 is a comment on the political situation in the state of Wei, not a general statement about social policy. But when was 13.3 composed? Because I think that's interesting as well. Well, now we have to say something about this really thorny topic, which parts of the Analects, the Lunyu, may reliably be attributed to Kungza and his immediate disciples. The traditional view is that all 20 books uh, can be attributed to Confucius's disciples soon after, almost immediately after the death of Confucius. The Japanese scholar Ito Jinsai uh, referred to books 1 to 10 as the upper analects and books 11 through 20 as the lower analects. Now, he, this doesn't mean that he thought 11 through 20 were necessarily spurious or fall or you know forgery, but it is interesting. If you look at the text of the analects, book 10, as we know, has a very special status. A lot, it has traditionally, book 10, been interpreted as a dis descriptions of the behavior of Kungsa. But I think to an impartial eye, most of Book 10 looks like a manual on ritual uh, describing a generic junza that has gotten interpolated into the text. And Books 11 through 20 seem on average stylistically different from Books 1 through 9. The passages get longer, they get more narratively complex. Um, so I think Ido Jinsai was on to some stylistic difference in the books, which seems to be marked by the interpolation of most of Book 10. Cui Shu is a great Qing Dynasty scholar, and Cui Shu argued on, I think, pretty powerful linguistics and, linguistic and grammatical grounds that books 16 through 20, the last five books of the Analects, are substantially later in composition to books 1 to 15. One of the greatest English translators, not just of, of Chinese literature, but also of Japanese literature, is Arthur Whaley. And Arthur Whaley in the Analects has an offhand comment where he says, I think books 3 through 9 are the earliest stratum of the Analects. Doesn't give us an argument for that, just says it offhand. Um, he's a smart guy, though, so maybe there's something to that. Then a few years ago, Bruce and Tycho Brooks, in their book, The Original Analects, argued that the only sections of the Analects that are actual records of things that Kungza said were chapters 1 through 14 in book 4 and chapters 16 and 17 in book 4. Everything else in the Analects just kind of was an accretion around this core, almost like coral, building up gradually over an inner core. And uh, Bruce and Tycho Brooks have this elaborate theory dating precisely uh, books and individual chapters in books to 
uh, later periods in Chinese history. And then most recently, uh, my friend and colleague at Yale, Mick Hunter in Confucius Beyond the Analects says, none of the Analects is a, an authentic record of what Kungza and his immediate disciples said. The entire work is a forgery from the Han Dynasty. Well, what should we believe here? I have a, a kind of uh, old fashioned view. I think the hour received Analects is largely a work of the fifth century BCE. And I think there are a number of good reasons for thinking this is true. Um, Mick Hunter has a statistical argument for why he thinks the Analects has got to be a Han Dynasty work. I think it's uh, technically flawed as a statistical argument, and I'm happy to discuss in the questions if you want to know why I think it's clearly mistaken. Uh, but that there, there are independent reasons for thinking the Analects as we have it is a fifth century uh, BC work. Um, and some of these arguments are ones that I came up on my own. Other ones uh, are ones that I was anticipated in uh, by uh, thinkers like my friend uh, Edward Slingerland, who's done an Analects translation. Um, one reason for believing this is that by the fourth century BCE, Central to philosophical debate were concepts such as Xing, nature, and Qi. By the Western Han, Yin Yang, Wu Xing, and Li were also central to philosophical debates. But in the received Analects, we find the following occurrences. Qi is used a grand total of six times in the Analects. Three of those occurrences are in a passage in Book 16, which is in the stratum that Sui Shu identified as late. Two of those are in Book 10, which, as we've seen, is kind of a weird book. And only one of them is in what Ido Jinsai called the Upper Analects proper. Xing, human nature, is found in only two passages in the Analects, which is impossible if this is a work of the fourth century, much less the Han Dynasty. One of those passages is Analects 17.2, which is very vague and is in the, the, la the late stratum identified by Tsui Shu. The other passage is 5.12. Uh, PJ Ivanhoe has a great article about Analects 5.12 and the different ways it's been interpreted. But the most straightforward way of understanding 5.12 is uh, Zogong says the master doesn't talk about uh, human nature and the way of heaven. Uh, uh, Yin-Yang never used in the cosmological sense in the received Analects, Wu Xing, five phases, never used in the received Analects, Li, pattern principle, never used in the received version of the text. Compare that with other works of the fourth century BCE or much even more so in the, the Western Han. Now, so I, my inclination is to think the received Analects probably was composed a few decades at most after the death of Kungza, which was probably for around 479 BCE. But of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't earlier and later passages within the received Analects. As we've seen, the last five books, I think Tsui Shu's right, that's pretty late, um, and some people have argued that the 13.3 dealing with Zheng Ming is a, an interpolation in the text. For example, I mentioned Arthur Whaley. He said 13.3 is an interpolation on the part of Shunza or his school, for whom the absence of any reference in the sayings of Kungza to what they themselves taught as a fundamental doctrine must certainly have been inconvenient. So Whaley is suggesting Zheng Ming is a concept invented by Shunza, and so either Shunza or his later followers interpolated 13.3 into the Analects to justify the centrality of the doctrine of Zheng Ming in the thought of, uh, of, of Confucian thinkers. And it is true, and, and Whaley points this out, there are some stylistic anomalies in 13.3. 13.3 is written in a chain argument style. If A, then B. If B, then C. If C, then D. This style is characteristic of later warring states and Western Han texts, but it's not characteristic of most of the Analects. 
So, and what I mean by this style is if names are not rectified, speech will not be in accordance. When speech is not in accordance, things will not be successfully accomplished. Compare that to another text that we have reason to believe is late, the classic section of the Da Shue, the great learning. When one knows the place to rest, only then is one settled. When one is settled, only then is, then is one able to be tranquil. When one is tranquil, only then is one able to be at peace. In addition, uh, I think you can understand Zulu's comment in 13.3 as prolepsis. Prolepsis is the rhetorical device of anticipating an objection your audience or your reader will have and putting something in the text to address that objection before it is raised. If, as some people have claimed, Zheng Ming is a central concept in Confucian thought, why is Zulu so shocked when the master brings it up? Zulu said, could you master really be so far off the mark? Why worry about rectifying names? And the master replied, how boorish you are, Zulu. This rhetorical structure makes sense if the, the people who wrote 13.3 knew that most readers would be surprised to find Kungzi discussing Zheng Ming. And so they put that concern into the mouth of Zulu only to have it swatted down by the master. The implication is, well, if you're surprised Kungzi is talking about uh, Zheng Ming, then you're just as boorish and uninformed as Zulu was. And this last argument is something that is uh, my contribution to the debate. Uh, the term Ming, name, or title, occurs only eight times in all of the Analects, which again is surprising if Zheng Ming is so central to the thought of Kungzi. Not only that, three of the eight occurrences in the Analects of Ming are in 13.3 itself. One more is in 17.9, which notice is in that late stratum of the text identified by Sui Shu where Kungza says, the odes also broadly acquaint you with the names of various birds, beasts, plants, and trees. That's always struck me as a weird passage. Like of all the things Confucius could tell you about the odes, well, you know, you get to learn the names of different birds, beasts, plants, and trees. You know, it sounds like a grade school teacher trying to convince you that your homework assignment is actually worthwhile. And, and notice, in my opinion, in every other occurrence in the Analects of the term Ming, outside of 17.9 and 13.3, Ming probably means fame or good reputation. For example, in 9.2, how great is Kungza? He is so broadly learned and yet has failed to make a name for himself, Cheng Ming, in any particular endeavor. And I think that was the earlier meaning of Ming. It means fame or good reputation. So I think Analects 13.3 is a comment on the political situation in a way. It's a specific comment occasioned by that situation, not a general statement about social policy. And it's an anomalous passage in the text. Um, its vocabulary is anomalous. Its style is anomalous. It's got this weird rhetorical structure where Zulu is shocked by this topic that Kungs is bringing up, um, uh, all of which suggests that it was added fairly late to the text. I think a last thing it's important for understanding the way people understand the rectification of names is the history of English language interpretations of 13.3. And I think this really explains why, again, it's less common today, but when I was first studying Chinese philosophy, there were entire books devoted to organizing interpretations of Chinese thought around the Confucian doctrine of the rectification of names and how that was uh, you know, dealt with in other texts in the period, even though this phrase, Zheng Ming, occurs only in one passage in the Analects. A really important figure in both the Chinese and the Eng contemporary English, especially 20th century uh, accounts of Chinese thought is Hu Shi, um, who died the year I was born. So uh, kind of a, like a fun tidbit there. 
And Husher, of course, came to the United States. He was supposed to study agriculture, but he changed his major to philosophy. Uh, I think he was at first at Cornell, and then uh, he went on to get a doctorate in philosophy at Columbia, where he studied under Dewey. Now, in the early 20th century, you know, what would you be learning at a philosophy department like Columbia? Well, we'll look at that in a moment. But first, the Husher's doctoral dissertation was later published as a book, The Development of the Logical Method in Ancient China. And in this book, Husher, who is, of course, a major figure in the May 4th movement, the movement that's trying to modernize China in the light of Western philosophy, Western science, Western technology, Western democracy, Western women's rights, all these things. Husher explains his agenda behind writing this book, The Development of the Logical Method in Ancient China. He says, where can we find a congenial stock with which we Chinese may organically link the thought systems of modern Europe and America so that we may further build up our own science and philosophy on a new foundation of the internal assimilation of the old and the new? My interest in the rediscovery of the logical theories and methods of ancient China is primarily a pedagogical one. I have the strongest desire to make my own people see that these methods of the West are not totally alien to the Chinese mind. So Hu Shu basically tells you that what he's doing is he's trying to find analogs in ancient Chinese thought for Western styles of reasoning. And what was really important in Anglo-American philosophy in the early 20th century was the philosophy of language. And so in his outline history of Chinese philosophy, and this is my translation, who sure says name correctionism is the central issue of Kung's teachings. So Hu sure is very well trained in traditional Chinese thought. But he studies philosophy first in the United States, first at uh, Cornell, then at Columbia. And at this period in history, the philosophy of language is central to Anglo-American philosophy. And he says he's looking for a way to link indigenous Chinese thought to contemporary Western thought so that his countrymen will be more receptive to accepting Western ways of thought. And so on his reading, he makes the philosophy of language, which is the way he interprets the rectification of names, central to all of Confucius's thought. Well, Feng Yolan remarks that when he and other intellectuals in China first read Hu Shu's writings on the history of Chinese philosophy, their minds were blown, as we say in English. They were just amazed by it. And so Feng Yolan wrote a history of Chinese philosophy, first in Chinese, and then it was translated into English by Dirk Boddy of my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I think Dirk Boddy's uh, translation it itself is a major accomplishment because Feng Yolan, of course, leaves most of the classic texts untranslated. He gives the Wenyan, but he doesn't, you know, uh, 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 so uh, Dirk Boddy had to translate all the, not only what Feng Yolan said, but these all these classical Chinese texts into English. And it's quite an accomplishment. And for decades, Feng, Dirk Boddy's translation of Feng Yolan's A History of Chinese Philosophy was the best-selling history of Chinese philosophy in English. And as such, it had an immense influence on the way people in the United States and other parts of the West read Chinese thought. And Feng Yolan acknowledges his deep debt to Hu Shi. And in interpreting the doctrine of rectification of names, here's what Feng Yolan says. Every name possesses its own definition. Where does Kung Zha say that? Which designates that which makes the thing to which the name is applied be that thing and no, and no other. 
This sounds like Socrates and Plato, not like, not like Kungsa. In other words, the name is that thing's essence or concept. What is pointed out by the definition of the name ruler, for example, is that essence which makes a ruler a ruler. In the phrase, let the ruler be ruler, etc., the first word ruler refers to ruler as a material actuality, while the second ruler is the name and concept of the ideal ruler. Likewise for the other terms, minister, father, and son. Now this is, and I'm hardly the first person to point this out, this is taking a kind of Neoplatonism and projecting it onto Chinese philosophy. But Neoplatonism is exactly what you would have learned. It's one of the things you would have learned studying philosophy in the United States in the early 20th century because of the deep influence of thinkers like Bertrand Russell. So my third thesis is the contemporary belief that rectifying names is a central concept in the Analects resulted from Hu Shi and Feng Yolan reading back into the Analects, the analytic philosophy of language they learned when they studied in the U.S. Now, what exactly would they have learned? Well, one of the leading figures who transformed 20th century philosophy in the English-speaking world was Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell was kind of a hero of mine growing up, and I still teach his, uh, you know, his work, Problems of Philosophy. Uh, but I, I think, and now I think he's wrong about most things, uh, but he was still a very, very interesting kind of figure. And one of the things Russell was really interested in was the philosophy of language. So famously, Russell was concerned with uh, analyzing logically statements like, the present king of France is not bald. It's not that that sentence in itself is that important. It's not. But Russell thought it was a great example of a sentence that you can understand better by understanding the underlying logical structure, which is not visible on the surface. The problem is the phrase, the present king of France, does not refer to anyone. So how is the sentence meaningful? There were people at this time, like uh, Menon, who said, well, there's an abstract entity, the present king of France, which uh, subsists, but does not exist in space and time. And that's how the sentence is meaningful. And Russell said, that's kind of a, that's a lot to buy into just to make sense out of this sentence. So Russell said the underlying logical structure of the sentence, the present king of France is not bald, is there exists an X such as K of X, and for all y, k of y implies y equals x, and not b of x. Put paraphrased into ordinary English, this means there exists something that is the present king of France, and there is at most one thing like this, and that thing is not bald. So the I put part of the logical formula in red and part of the paraphrase in red. It's not the most important part of the expression. It's just so you can see visually what part of the formal logical formalism corresponds to um, a more normal English paraphrase. Now, why do I think that example is so important, you know, for understanding what Hu Shi and Feng Yolan were doing? Take a sentence like jun bu jun or gu bu gu, Jun Bu Jun means a ruler is not a ruler. If you're trained in the kind of tradition that goes back through people like Bertrand Russell, you think, well, literally, a ruler is not a ruler means there exists an X such that R of X and not R of X. The problem is that, a state, that statement appears to be contradictory. And one of the fundamental commitments of Western philosophy going back to Aristotle is that there are no true contradictions. There are no contradictions in reality. If you've got a contradiction, that's a logical mistake. It's got to be fixed. The solution that occurs to you if you're trained in the Rosalian tradition is to engage in what is sometimes called semantic assent, where you stop talking about things like rulers and you start talking about terms or in this case, names like ruler. So if you say a ruler is not a ruler, someone trained in the Rosalian tradition is going to say, oh, 
the underlying logical form here. What you really mean is something like, there exists a person who is called a ruler who is not a ruler. And likewise, if you say a goo is not a goo, goo boo goo, goodzai, goodzai. Um, literally, that is, there exists an X such that G of X and not G of X. That can't be right. That's a contradiction. There can't be a contradiction in reality. Therefore, the underlying logical form of this statement must be something like, there exists a thing that is called a goo that is not a goo. Now, and these analyses of these statements are so attractive if you're raised in a certain kind of philosophical tradition that they might almost seem to be compulsive, like, well, how else could you possibly read those passages? Well, let's try to read these passages without semantic assent. The passage says, a ruler is not a ruler, a minister is not a minister, a father is not a father, a son is not a son. What if we interpreted that as just meaning the relationships between rulers, ministers, fathers, and sons had all lost the way. No semantic assent here. No talking about names, father, son, ruler, minister. Well, would any Chinese thinker say that, though? Oh, yeah. This is what Zhu Xi says in his commentary on the passage. He does not invoke semantic assent. He just says this. Well, but what about a goo is not a goo? Surely you need semantic assent for that. Maybe not. Cheng Yi comments on this. A goo that has lost its regulation shape is not a goo. I'm referring to this one vessel, but everything in the world is the same way. Hence, a ruler who has lost the way of a ruler is not a ruler. A minister who has lost the responsibilities of a minister occupies an empty role. So it's not about calling something a goo. It's about the fact that a goo with the wrong shape isn't a goo. Again, if you're trained in the Rosalian tradition, you say, well, you must mean something like it's just called a goo. But you don't have to say that. You might just say, no, a goo that's lost its regulation shape is not a goo. So I think Analytics 13.3 is a comment on the specific political situation in a way. It's an anomalous passage, probably added late. The contemporary belief that rectifying names is a central concept in the Analects, or perhaps even a central concept in all of early Chinese thought, resulted from Hu Shi and Feng Yolan projecting onto the Analects the analytic philosophy of language they learned when they studied in the U.S. And many of the passages that Hu Shi, Feng Yolan, and others have claimed were about rectifying names including some of the ones I used at the beginning of my talk to illustrate rectifying names, do not discuss names or what something is called at all. So they're really not evidence that rectifying names was a central concept in the Analects. And ironically, I'll just mention one last thing about this. Uh, one of the reasons I think Feng Yolan's history of Chinese philosophy has been so popular in the West is that people have a, a very understandable and commendable desire to want to learn about Chinese philosophy as it's represented by Chinese thinkers. And so they see, oh, this history of Chinese philosophy is by a Chinese thinker, Feng Yolan, and therefore it'll be more authentic. But ironically, Feng Yolan is projecting a Western view, a very Platonistic Western view, and Bertrand Russell was an, an avowed Platonist uh, throughout his career onto earlier thinkers in the Chinese tradition. And Hu Shi, who inspired Feng Yolan, was avowedly trying to find ways to read Western-style philosophy back into ancient Chinese texts. So what lessons can we learn from all this? Well, uh, I said earlier that uh, Bertrand Russell was one of my uh, intellectual heroes growing up. I still admire him very much as a public intellectual. I think he was a very impressive person. Uh, but philosophically, I'm less in the kind of modernist, rationalist tradition of people like Russell and the empiricist tradition of people like Russell and more in the hermeneutic tradition of people like Gadamer, and I would say also Alistair McIntyre is in this tradition as well. And one of my favorite quotations from Hans Georg Gadamer's Truth and Method is, a person who is trying to understand a text 
is always projecting. He projects a meaning for the text as a whole as soon as some initial meaning emerges in the text. Again, the initial meaning emerges only because he is reading the text with particular expectations in regard to a certain meaning. So when you read any text, you have to bring presuppositions to that text. There's no way to read a text without presuppositions. Indeed, the assumption that you're looking at a text as opposed to looking at meaningless squiggles or something else is a kind of projection. You're assuming you know what you're looking at and what that it is a text and what kind of text it is, what language it's in, um, and what the terms mean and what conceptual background it has. Does that mean that anything goes since we're always projecting meaning onto the text? No, Gautamer explains it is the tyranny of hidden prejudices that makes us deaf to what speaks to us in tradition. And so if we're not aware of the ways in which a certain style of doing philosophy in the English-speaking world was picked up by people like Hu Shi and Feng Yolan, who projected it onto Chinese texts and then influenced generations of Western interpreters who followed them thinking they were getting an authentic Chinese interpretation of the text, that can make it harder for us to see the ways in which that reading distorts the original text. And if I may be forgiven introducing one final thesis in my conclusion, we thesis five, we must make assumptions about the meaning of a text in order to begin to understand it. However, we must be willing to revise our assumptions in the light of what we discover as we read. In addition, we can do a better job of revising our assumptions if we're aware of the history of interpretations of the text. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Van Norden. Um, this is indeed a very um, both inspiring and captivating lecture. I believe all of us have learned a lot and also very much enjoyed this lecture. Um, it's you. very exciting that you show this hidden lineage in hidden lineage in modern discipline of Chinese philosophy, where there's this reconstruction amongst the interaction between like uh, American linguistic philosophy and like Asian Chinese intellectual sources. I really look forward to the forthcoming exchange that well, uh, between you and our commentators and. Um, please allow me to first introduce our first commentator. Um, professor Liu Qin is associate professor in the School of Philosophy at Wuhan University. She received her PhD from Peking University in 2020. Her research interests are mainly in the study of new Confucianism in the Song and Ming dynasties, especially Zhu Xi's philosophy and their modern interpretation in the context of comparative philosophy between East and West. Let's welcome Professor Liu Qin. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Norden. Uh, Professor Van Norden's idea was very innovative and brought about a revolution in my thinking. I think it's a very good lecture. Um, the Chinese academic community, uh, as we know, generally accept the idea that uh, Zhengming is the central idea of Confucius. But Professor Van Norden opposed this common view and provide us with some brand new perspectives. I think it's very important. Uh, Professor Van Norden points out that the reason why uh, the reason why the reason why Zhengming is a, was a central issue in Ch early Chinese philosophy brought up by Hu Shi and Feng Yolan actually is because they study in the West while being influenced by Western philosophy of language. I uh, totally agree with uh, Professor Van Norden's idea. And uh, Zhengming itself is a norm for the ethical rules for social, uh, social communities, while Zhengming itself is not directly related to the issue of language, in my opinion. But I still have a small uh, question about Professor Van Norden's argument. Uh, Professor Van Norden mentions that uh, why Zi Lu is so shocked if Zhengming is a core idea of Confucius. 
but uh, so so Professor Van Norden tried to argue that Zhengming is not the central issue of Confucius. But um, as we know, in the Analex, we also have uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of stories that tells us that even the students of Kongzi, uh, who are very close to him, can not often understand his ideas. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the the story of uh, Kongzi talking to Zheng Shen and mentioning that uh, Wu Dao Yi Guan Zhi, and Zheng Shen know what Confucius mean, but uh, the students around Kongzi doesn't know what Kongzi mean. If Zhong Shu Zhi Dao is the Dao of Kongzi, why most of his students cannot understand him? So I think this argument may not be a little weak, but uh, uh, but I I totally agree on your uh, on your thesis actually. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, just a very <laughs> small question. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Van Norden. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you, Professor Van Norden, please. <laughs> now let us um, hear Professor Van Norden's response to Professor oh. Liu's question. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I, I thought maybe you'd have me wait until all the questions. Oh, that's okay. It's either, so... either way, fine. I'm happy to go now. So, yes, I think it's interesting you mentioned the passage in which uh, Zheng Zhe says, Fu Zhe Zhi Dao, Zhong Shu R E E. Actually, in a, uh, a published work I wrote uh, many years ago, I talk about both Zheng Ming. And also the uh, Zhongshu Rei -E passage, and I note that interpreters of the Analects usually organize their interpretation around either Fu uh, Zhi Dao Zhongshu Rei, -E, or they organize it around Zhengming. And I argue that neither passage is actually central to the thought of Kongza. And both of them, I think, are later interpolations. And so uh, perhaps some other time I can uh, give a talk about why I think uh, the the passage involving Zhengzi uh, and Wu uh, Dao, Yi Yi, Guan Zhi, uh, is uh, kind of suspect. But I think part, one of the reasons I think the passage is suspect is that uh, it's both surprising that uh, Zheng Zhe would just say in response to Kong Zhe saying, Wu Dao Yi Yi Guan Zhe, he just says, wait, what a strange response in response to someone saying so cryptic. And then after yeah. Kong Zhe said, there's one thing that binds his way together. When asked about it, Zheng Zhe says, Fu Zhe, zhe, fu zhe, zhe Dao Zhong Shu R Yi Yi. That's two things. That's not one thing. Uh, and Zhu yeah. Xi, in his commentary, has an ingenious explanation of this, but it involves the notion that there's kind of an almost, there's a hidden teaching in Confucianism. And if you think there are some interpreters who think that there are esoteric Confucian mm -hmm. teachings that the master only revealed to his most advanced disciples. And if you think that, it would make it easier to hold both that Zheng Ming was central to the thought of Confucius or to hold that the uh, the, uh, the the e, the the e, the one thing that holds the way of the master together is Zhong Shu R E E. So I think that's a, uh, a short, long, long winded way of saying you, you raise an excellent point for comparison. And I think it depends on what we think in this case is going on with Zheng Zhe when he says Fu Zhi Dao Zhong Shu R E E. But I'm inclined to be suspicious of both that passage and the Zheng Ming passage. But excellent observation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Van Norden. It's very inspiring. I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> Thank oh, no, no. you very much. <laughs> Um, thank you for your uh, great exchange and um, 
Now, uh, please allow me to introduce our uh, second commentator today, uh, Professor Tsai Qinghua. She is Associate Professor at the School of Philosophy, Fudan University. She received her PhD from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and she is an expert in uh, her research focus on pre jin Taoism and Six Dynasties New Taoism, as well as linguistic philosophy in Chinese philosophy. Um, uh, and she also studies Taoism studies in the English speaking academy and the methodology of Chinese philosophy and comparative philosophy. Let's welcome Professor Tsai. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang's uh, int introduction. Uh, uh, Professor Wen Norden, uh, I think it's a, a very interesting lecture to me uh, because uh, I'm also quite interested in the linguistic problems in the uh, history of Chinese philosophy. I once uh, wrote my um, PhD thesis on the linguistic problems during the uh, in the Wei Jing Xuanxue during the the period after the Han Dynasty. So it's a quite interesting issue to me. Uh, I think uh, I have a a question to you. I have a question to you. Uh, I think I I quite agree with you that. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, when we read uh, the text, then uh, we should have uh, context uh, uh, sensitivity. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a very, uh, it, I think it's, uh, it's a very uh, reflective in this sense because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, also uh, it's not, not only in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the context of the analex, uh, but also in the other context of the uh, uh, classical Chinese uh, philosophy. Uh, the the uh, uh, classical Chinese philosophies. Uh, I think we also have such kinds of uh, uh, reflections. I think uh, your argumentation is uh, uh, very analytic and uh, clear to me. Uh, uh, so uh, my question is: uh, uh, In your talk, you mentioned that uh, uh, actually uh, you point you point. Uh, Pointed out a problem that uh, ne needs to be resought. Uh, uh, that uh, you mentioned several scholars in history, for example, Gra uh, A.C. Graham, uh, Benjamin Schwartz, and uh, Arthur Valley. Uh, all of them actually mentioned that uh, uh, Zheng Ming is uh, a kind of uh, a central issue in the uh, Kongzi's idea. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you actually mentioned the uh, mentioned Hu Shi and Fen Yulan, and uh, uh, your point is that uh, these two Chinese scholars actually uh, hold a very similar uh, views. However, uh, both Hu Shi and Fen Yulan actually uh, got some influences from uh, Western philosophy. So actually, I, I think uh, for this point, I, I'm. Um, uh, I think I got a lot from you because uh, I think it's very uh, reflective to say that uh, uh, Feng Yulan actually uh, got a lot of uh, influences from Western philosophy. Actually, my master's thesis is doing uh, the relationship between Feng Yulan's Xinli Xue and uh, new uh, uh, Platonism. So, so yeah. I, 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 I uh, quite agree with you that uh, Feng Yulan got a uh, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, got su such kinds of uh, in influences from Western philosophy. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 my question is, uh, it's not a, it's not a major one. It's just a minor one, I think. Uh, my question is, um, uh, okay. Uh, although, uh, even if uh, rectification of name is not the central issue of Confucius, here uh, I think uh, maybe. Uh, uh, we need to uh, rethink uh, to what extent that uh, the scholars hold that uh, uh, Zheng Ming is the central issue of uh, Confucius. Uh, then uh, to what extent, in what sense that they use central? So so mm -hmm. uh, this is my question. Uh, uh, to uh, From what sense that uh, central means for uh, the scholars hold such kinds of uh, uh, points. And uh, the the second, uh, following uh, such kinds of uh, uh, questions, uh, I think even if rectification name is not the central issue of Confucius, uh, 
I think as to my understand, I think uh, the content of uh, Zhengming uh, still has, uh, the, the content of uh, 13.3 uh, still has a central normative meaning. Mm -hmm. Especially if we combine it with other aspects of Confucius thought, such as how to become a virtuous person. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, uh, no, uh, 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 let me see. Uh, let rulers be rulers, uh, the minister be minister, fathers uh, be fathers, sons be son. Uh, I think uh, all of these statements still has a kind of uh, normative uh, mm -hmm. Function. I mean, uh, uh, in the in the Confucius context. So, uh, to my understanding, I still uh, think that Ming names plays a kind of uh, normative function in the mm -hmm. Confucius context. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm not quite sure if uh, my understanding is uh, uh, is right uh, uh, mm -hmm. or right or not. But uh, I, I would like to, you know, discuss with you about this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, th those are really great comments. I mean, th these have been two wonderful, uh, very generous and insightful sets of comments. I think you're you're right. And when I've one issue that's come up in previous occasions when I've given this talk is to say, well, if we're denying that Zheng Ming is central, is it is it does that mean it's completely irrelevant, or do you just mean it's it's not central in a certain way. I think for P what I'm denying is, I think that in different ways, uh, scholars who take Zheng Ming to be central to Confucianism end up thinking that somehow language or literary texts or etymology or philology um, or the philosophy of language are crucial for understanding Confucianism. And I, I think what I want to suggest is certainly if you're a Confucian, you want to know what the words in the Analects mean. Uh, and certainly you want to use words like shall and run uh, and other terms correctly. But I'd say that those are secondary issues for Confucians in the sense that the primary concern is to cultivate virtue in oneself and to try to help with others construct a society in which people with virtue can effectively be role models and leaders for others. And so the, the philosophy of language and philology and etymology are secondary tasks in this. And what I'm afraid of is interpret or opposed to is interpretations that would make things like philology, you know, Kao Zhengxue, or uh, etymology, the history of characters, or the philosophy of language really central to Confucianism as opposed to an emphasis on things like cultivating virtues and acting on those virtues in the world. And I think there have been, especially in say the in the Han dynasty, you know, there were a tendency to overemphasize uh, literary accomplishments over the cultivation of virtue. And I think among some Westerners who were influenced by the notion of Zheng Ming, there was a similar tendency to think that well, Confucianism is almost just a theory of philosophy of language, because that's what philosophy was for a large part of the 20th century. So, but I think you're right. The basic insight that you think, if we say things like, well, you, if you are in a family, you want to have a functional family and you want to be a good father or a good mother or a good son or a good daughter, or if you're a teacher, you want to be a good teacher. If you're a student, you want to be a good student. That's true. And I just know you can believe all that without necessarily engaging in semantic assent, where we phrase that in terms of talking about names as opposed to talking about actualities. But I think it's a it's a subtle. Uh, you raise an excellent and subtle point. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Tai and Professor Van Norden for this brilliant conversation. So now 
Let me introduce our third and last commentator, Professor Liu Liangjian. Professor Liu is professor and the dean of the Department of Philosophy, East China Normal University. He is also a professor of the Institute of Modern Chinese Thought and Culture at ECNU and a researcher of the Institute of Wisdom in China of ECNU. His research interests focus on the history of Chinese philosophy, comparative study of Chinese and Western philosophy, and linguistic philosophy. He is the author of Heaven, Humans, and Inter relationship, a metaphysical interpretation of Wang Chuanshan, an introduction to the linguistic philosophy based on the experience of Chinese language, and also philosophical examinations with the approach of the linguistic philosophy based on the experience of Chinese language, and a philosophical interpretation of the little prince. Let us welcome Professor Liu Liangjian. Thank you, Yanqi, and thank you, Professor Van uh, Van Norden. Uh, it's a very inspiring uh, lecture. I totally agree with uh, Yanqi. And say at the last point, you uh, you, you mentioned the uh, Gardner. I think the hermeneutics uh, history of the NLEX uh, uh, thirty three is a good example to illustrate the uh, theory of Gardner. Uh, and sometimes Gadamer will say, uh, you, you mentioned uh, prejudice, and sometimes he will say uh, prejudice is also productive and also necessary for us to uh, to have some good or possible understanding on the, uh, on the text. Uh, and my question uh, will focus on uh, how to understand uh, uh, the meaning, uh, the rectification of the name, and we can say it's a very interesting uh, question for me. I think maybe uh, we can understand the uh, Zemin at uh, different levels. Uh, first, to say Zemin uh, uh, is meant to how to uh, find or how to correctly uh, define a name. Uh, for example, just uh, in, uh, in the index, Jin Jin, Chen Chen, Fu Fu, Zi Zi. Maybe you see the first level here, we'll say uh, this uh, means, Jin Jin, Chen Chen, Fu Fu, Zi Zi means that uh, uh, how to uh, find, uh, just, but we can understand it at the level of uh, terms or, or words, how to uh, how to uh, uh, how to uh, have a good definition of gene, how to have a good definition of term, uh, yeah, as you say. And this also will uh, mention us that uh, when we want to understand uh, gene, we cannot, uh, gene cannot be separated from uh, term, yeah, uh, because you have uh, there in the uh, framework. Uh, we understand, uh, uh, want to understand the one word, you have, we have to understand uh, a lot of yeah, yeah, a group of terms uh, they uh, must be, to be support each other. Uh, jin Jin Chen Chen Jin and Jin and Chen Fu and uh, Fu and Zi. Uh, maybe uh, I think uh, maybe this is the first level. How to find a good definition, uh, a suitable definition uh, for the uh, for the name. Uh, so uh, and then we can uh, find the first understanding of Jin Jin Chen Chen Fu and Zi. Uh, and the second level, maybe uh, how to apply uh, the name uh, to the reality. Uh, here, I think maybe reality is, uh, uh, the, uh, the, is better than the objects because the reality will be more comprehensive. Uh, when we say object, we will, may, will easily will lead us to, uh, uh, to refer to the birds, the trees, or uh, sometimes the, the people, or some uh, uh, political or social. Uh, role of the person, uh, but reality maybe uh, more than that. Uh, we can include uh, the uh, social action, uh, something like that. Maybe. Uh, uh, so uh, at the, at this level, I, I think uh, Jin Jin maybe a uh, uh, different way to understand the relationship is possible. The first, just as uh, in the uh, uh, the translation of uh, Professor uh, Van Norden uh, provides, can the rulers be ruler. The first uh, the name uh, Ru uh, is a ruler, is a reality, and the second is a term. Uh, but I think it's also possible to say Jun, Jun can be understood. Uh, the first is a term, ruler, and the second is a re real ruler, okay, or the reality. Uh, and then Jun Jun means uh, can we apply the name or the term ruler to the real ruler? Yeah, uh, so I think it also is possible, uh, but, but uh, maybe we can uh, uh, keep the same uh, meaning. Uh, and then, if the Jun Bu Jun, the ruler, Jun Bu Jun, you can see uh, the ruler uh, is not uh, uh, the ideal ruler, 
or can say uh, the term ruler uh, cannot be applied to the ruler, right? In the reality, uh, yeah, here uh, uh, when there is no correspondence or uh, uh, between uh, the uh, the ruler and the name uh, the term ruler, uh, we have to uh, reform uh, the name. And here, uh, I think uh, it's possible. Uh, to reform the name, uh, there's also two possible uh, mm, mm, uh, meanings. One is that when we say reform the name, we can say we change the connotation or the meaning of the name, and then make the, this name too suitable to the reality. Uh, for example, uh, 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 I take the uh, example from the Zhou. Uh, we have say Zhou uh, and the king, we apply the king to the Zhou. We find that the king is not suitable to Zhou. Then we want to like say one way to reform the name uh, king is that we change the meaning of the king. And so uh, we can say if uh, it's anybody who takes the political uh, position of the uh, the top position, we can call it uh, uh, one, call it a king. No matter uh, he is better, uh, he is good or not, no matter he is virtuous or vicious, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so it is where we change the meaning of the king, and then uh, let, uh, be, uh, let it uh, uh, suitable to uh, the Zhou, reality Zhou. Uh, this is one way to reform the, uh, the name. Uh, but another way to reform the name is they say we for, uh, we we will try to introduce a new uh, term uh, to uh, describe uh, uh, the, the Zhou by saying the Zhou is they is a safe or uh, evil a uh, one man a uh, one person uh, but we keep uh, the mean uh, keep a one keep the kin unchanged but but we have to introduce a new uh, a new uh, new name to describe this reality uh, so. Uh, so uh, here is the uh, uh, some point is that uh, uh, maybe we can have two different ways to understand the, to reform the name uh, to uh, to suit the object or to suit the reality, and in the reality uh, in the area uh, uh, as far as the social order is concerned, I think if we introduce a new uh, term uh, to uh, to do a new term, for example, uh, introduce the safe uh, to apply to the Zhou, uh, it's very important that here, uh, I will agree with uh, uh, Professor Cai Qinghua that mentioned that the normative uh, force or normative function of the term. Uh, even Zhou is called as a uh, Zhe, uh, we can say it's justified to kill the Zhou, right? He ought to bring a new order, uh, bring uh, uh, evoke uh, 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 corresponding uh, uh, mm, uh, political uh, conduct and try to change uh, the, uh, the world and try to uh, bring uh, the uh, political uh, social order in a new way. Uh, so, so here I think maybe uh, the normative force, the uh, normative power of a name is very important. And I think maybe it's also uh, I, I wonder, it was also a primary concern for the Confucianism, uh, not only the self cultivation, uh, uh, but also how to bring social or, or, or political order to the whole world is a primarily a uh, very important concern for uh, Confucians. Uh, so uh, uh, I think, uh, and at the last, that <clears throat> if, uh, even in uh, the the index uh, uh, thirteen three or the index twelve or eleven, uh, I think uh, uh, the primary concern uh, maybe is the how to bring a political and social order, and they say uh, uh, Zemin here how Zemin functions. Uh, I wonder only one possible uh, possible if especially as uh, uh, Zhe and Kui uh, is concerned. They say uh, if Zhe or Kui really uh, understand, really know the name Jun or Fu Chen or Fu or Zi, and then they will change their, uh, they will change how to what to do. And it may be, uh, I think, I, I don't know if there are comments, uh, history comments in on uh, this, and like I said, uh, uh, they wanted to uh, father be the father, uh, son be the son, or uh, Jun, uh, then they will be a good, uh, uh, this uh, order uh, in uh, in a state of way, yeah, uh, I see something like that. But here maybe you can see uh, if we want to say Kui or Zhou really mean 
uh, or here we can use uh, uh, the term uh, from uh, from Yangmin, if they have a genuine knowledge of mm. uh, Jing and Chen or the Fu and Zi, and they will really know how to do according to the normative or the terms, and then uh, this, the, the, the world of critical order will change. Uh, maybe here uh, is also interesting. And also, I think I want to imagine if Zhou really or have a genuine meaning of ruler, maybe he will change himself and he will uh, stop to be a Z or be a if maybe <laughs> is this you know just the imagine uh, uh, so uh, this uh, this is uh, my comments and uh, my focus uh, yeah my question is how to understand the uh, the justify uh to, how to justify the name and maybe they have uh, three, uh, maybe three or, or different levels to how to understand the justification of names uh, thank you. Well, again, that those are really uh, deeply insightful and wide-ranging comments. Um, I'll try to, I hope I can do justice to them. One thing I sometimes uh, think about is to use this framework. Western philosophy, with starting with Socrates, becomes very obsessed with not giving examples. Socrates says to the people he talks to, don't give me examples of things that are just or pious. Uh, give me the definition. Give me the logos uh, of what it is to be just or pious or courageous. And the idea in the tradition that goes back to Plato seems to be if you got the concept which is embodied in the definition of courage or justice or wisdom or piety, you would then know what to do and also be motivated to do. But after a couple thousand years of fruitlessly searching for definitions, uh, Wittgenstein in the 20th century comes along and questions whether or not we should even expect to find definitions for the most interesting terms. And uh, Wittgenstein's approach is, I think, mostly destructive. Wittgenstein wants to tell us that the search for definitions is misguided. He doesn't give us as much guidance about where to go. But the implication of the Wittgensteinian approach is that examples um, concrete examples are often better than actual definitions. So if you want to know what it is to be a good ruler, look at the examples of sages like Shun. Um, and if you want to see an example of someone who's a really good son, you could also look at Shun because he was a really great son. And if you want to have an example of somebody who's a bad ruler, you could look at Joe. And so the Wittgensteinian approach suggests that maybe the way to find the truth isn't by definition, it's by looking at concrete examples. And I think it's intriguing to look at Confucianism as more interested in concrete examples and specific guidance and less interested in the quest for definitions. Since Kongza himself, uh, you know, really almost never gives us definitions. Maybe the closest he comes is in the case of Shu, Jiswa Bu Yu, Wu Shi Yu Ren. But that's one of the few terms in the Analects where Kongza gives us something that looks like an actual definition. Instead, he just gives us examples or instances to illustrate various terms. But I think the lesson from Wittgenstein might be that might be a more productive way to go than looking for a definition that gives you an essence. Um, so that's just an alternative way that one might think about some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Liu and Professor Van Norden for this fruitful discussion. And 
uh, for the uh, for the reason of lack of time, now we will open our floor to the uh, audience for only one question. If any audience have a question, please just open your mic and uh, ask this question. Whoever uh, opens the mic first gets the question. Um, so in the chat, uh, Jing Bo Hu wants to raise a question, but you can just open your mic. Hello, could you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. I hear you. Um, thank you, Renaud, and such a wonderful talk. And I find your claim very interesting and surprising that um, naming or the ratification of naming never occupies a central place in um, Kong's philosophy. And I find it surprising because there seems to be a consensus that, um, at least at the um, area of warring states, um, naming or ratifying naming became the very um, central philosophical themes. So, mm. um, for example, the later more um, are very interested in topics related to um, linguists and logics. Um, and as you mentioned, um, the, the later Confucianist Xunzi has the passage um, specific on ratifying name, and we even have a, 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 a school of names um, who um, mm -hmm. devote themselves to um, starting and discussing names. So um, if, if, as you claim that um, naming or ratifying naming um, is not a, was not a central um, topic in Kong's philosophy, how would you um, explain such um, sudden shift um, at the area of um, um, the warning state that everybody suddenly became so interested in naming or ratifying naming. Yeah, that, that's my question. That is a gr excellent question. I'm really glad you raised that. Uh, this is, I think, it shows why we have to read things holistically. There is, uh, there's not an organized school, the Ming job, but there are thinkers like Hui Shi and Gong Sun Longzi, who are interested in names, but notice they're thinkers of probably around the, the fourth century BCE. And we know that Hui Shi was a rough contemporary of Mengzi, but Mengzi doesn't seem interested in names at all or rectifying names. So what this suggests is that it's only after people like Gong Sun Lungza and Hui Shi make the issue of names central to Chinese thought that it becomes an issue for later thinkers. But if that's right, then we shouldn't expect Kung Zha to be interested in that issue at all because it only becomes an issue in Chinese thought uh, a little after Meng Zha in say the fourth century BCE. So uh, and I think the fact that we just we don't see any in particular interest in the rectification of names in Mengzi, uh, even not even bothering to dismiss it, Mengzi does have opinions about language and its role, but he phrases them in terms of uh, the connection between uh, Yan uh, and Xin and Qi. Uh, which is already a, a different framework from the one that we find in the received analects, but a real focus on names in this Ming in the sense of names, as opposed to Ming in the sense of fame or reputation. I think that only becomes central to Chinese thought with people like Wei Shi and Gong Song Meng. So that's that's my alternative theory of how the history of Chinese thought plays out. But right after that point, people are interested in it. And that's why the Mo the later Moists, again, not the early Moists, in the synoptic chapters, you know, like Gen I, we don't find an emphasis on Ming in the sense of names. But again, that suggests it's only later in Chinese history that this becomes a central issue. So that's my reading of the tradition anyway. Thank you, Professor Wernodin. That's rare house. Thank you, that's a great question. Thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you, Professor Van Norden, for a very fruitful and very inspiring answer. And now I want to thank everybody again for, uh, of course, first thank Professor Van Norden for giving the uh, 
exciting lecture, and thank you for um, Professor uh, Liu, Professor Cai, Professor Liu Qin, uh, for uh, for the discussion, the questions, the comments, um, and also for our audience for coming to this event. Um, we have reached to the conclusion of today's uh, session. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you next time at Sihai Wei Xue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Professor Norden. See you next yeah. time in Wuhan University, I hope. Yes. <laughs> Professor oh, Norden. I, <laughs> I hope so.